Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. What does it take to be a newsreader? Flooding is still. You'll need nerves of steel. Leicestershire and the Seven Valley, where thousands of acres are underwater. Sorry about that. And one of my friends said to me, oh, what was the matter with you? Were you drunk? <laughs> the African... Perfect Muslim diction. ...have given a firm no. Instead of talking about uh, Turkish Kurds once, it came out as Kurdish turds. This is Jeff Moore, Jeff Mead, TVM News, live Eastern, Sa Eastern Saudi Arabia. Now, industrial news. A steady hand. <laughs> He said, "I'll move it. Nine sprechen English." And I thought, "Oh my God!" Then the city and the ability to stay calm, whatever happens. I mean, eight ah! Oh my gosh! As you can see, they're not physical. <laughs> it's a nightmare, and it's an absolute guaranteed way of making a complete prat of yourself. The headlines. <laughs> And I would like to tell you some more news, but I don't actually have it. <laughs> well, I do have some more. Some other business news uh, stories this morning. No, we haven't got that right either. <laughs> some people say, you can get monkeys to do it. You can train anybody to do that. A bill giving more autonomy to the French National Assembly has adopted, uh, must approve the measures before um, a constitutional review. I'm sorry, this uh, story is absolutely... Um, nonsense. I'll continue with... <laughs> I mean, it's just a reading job. Good evening, everyone. Let's talk sports. The NBA playoffs heading after another uh, truck shoe is... What am I looking at here? 90% of the time, 90% perhaps even or more, all you are doing is, at the end of the day, you are reading aloud. There were times when I felt that I was nothing more than a highly paid talking parrot. It is the other few percentage moments when it can get rather difficult. I am not going to go on arguing with you on a thing that I did not come here to discuss. But Mr. Tizard, your own Prime Minister has said that the way in which good this afternoon. was done... The way in which this was done does not look good. But gains are limited as investors keep a wary eye on the Bank of Japan's <laughs> Fortune Tank and Report. Oh, well, you often get the feeling um, that you'd really slightly rather be doing out the rabbits or uh, uh, cleaning up after the cat. Colin Baker for Thames News. Westminster, soaked with cold feet, a aching heart, married, several children, pissed off, really dreadfully pissed off. You have to be capable of ignoring all distractions. Let's take a look at what's going on in our nation's weather on this Monday. Meteorologist Craig Allen is standing by to read a story from the autocue in such a way that it makes sense first time, every time. A civil jury in Santa Monica uh, has... Uh, I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> you have to just be the sort of the, uh, the swan up there when your legs are sort of going like this, but up top, everything's looking quite sort of serene. <laughs> <laughs> all calm and collected on top and underneath, you're battling away like furious. And the state of Utah is suing the federal government over a recent... <laughs> on top of the water, it's all calm and serene, but underneath, the feet are going like the clappers. David Shookman is there. David. I'm not hearing anything, by the way, actually. <laughs> While what we see on screen might be all about poise and control, behind the scenes of television news, it's very different. Here in the newsroom of London Tonight, ITV's news programme in the capital, it's another hectic afternoon preparing for the evening news. It's high-tech, organised chaos. It's the newscaster's job to turn all this into the serenest of broadcasts. To do that, he can draw on a range of secret weapons hidden in his desk. This is really the newscaster's survival kit, everything you need to uh, get through. Hard copy of the scripts in case the teleprompter or auto cue fails. But even better than that, have got a computer set into the desk so that you can see the scripts down there and also you've got the news wires, the latest breaking stories coming through on the computer as well. And over here, a little monitor, a TV set, again, set into the desk so you can see what the people at home are seeing or at least what they should be seeing as well. Then, microphone, clips on there. 
there to make sure that they can hear you. And the most important bit of all, the lifeline, is this, the little earpiece. It just hooks on behind the ear. You shouldn't be able to see it, but it's through that that the producer and director downstairs can talk the whole time. It should all work. But, of course, it doesn't always. Alexandros Papadopoulos has unveiled his budget plan. Its main aim is to bring Greece in line with its European partners by the end... <laughs> Excuse me, right here. Keep going, keep going. In a bit. Thank you. And don't do that again. Here's Bill Giles. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. We, uh, we could see Bill Giles, but we couldn't hear him. I'm sure he was saying it was cold, but um, we couldn't actually tell. <laughs> Watching the today from the BBC. <laughs> we think we're coming out of this program now. But, uh... Anthony Dworkin. David Frost's problem, an interviewee 900 miles away. With American President George Bush about to arrive later today. Uh, Anthony, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? I can just, just hear something, yeah. Yes. Can you hear that it's me, for instance? No. I, I, can, I can hear a voice. I can't recognise anything. All right. Anything. Well, uh, let's, uh, let me just yell a simple question, then. Uh, we'll try yelling a simple question to Anthony and see if this works. Is this a difficult visit for George Bush? I'm not, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm not hearing anything just at the moment. All right, well, uh, I suppose it's, I suppose it's reasonable that you can't shout from London and be heard in <laughs> Warsaw, isn't it? The exercise, which was called... Wandering cameras and faulty microphones apart, there's one technological nightmare all too familiar to the news anchor. The video report that fails to arrive. The news station's Jake Hone was one of them. OK, we don't have that story right now. Things are always going wrong. Um, I can remember doing the 1 o'clock once, and I kept reading. It seemed like half an hour. It was probably about 10 minutes before we had a, a videotape report ready to go to. How about the ski report, guys? Because if we got that, the recent snow should make for a... We don't have that one either. All right. We just kept reading and reading and reading. It was mayhem in the gallery with the director saying, why is he reading that? You know, I couldn't answer back and say, I've got nothing else. Yeah. All right, well, let's go to something that we do have. We're having a little trouble with the machines in the background. Actually, let's go to a two-shot. We'll talk to Mike Hurd about the weather. Can we do that? Can we? Uh... We, have the we do have the tapes, folks. What, what tape do we have? But whatever the technology throws up, the golden rule of newscasting still applies. Remain calm. I remember one editor of ITN one day when we had a lot of technical problems, and I was furious. One of the bits of film which never came up, and they were film in those days, um, was something I know had been used in an earlier program. And I thought, in my silly mind, there was no reason at all why this shouldn't have come up. And I showed my exasperation on the screen. At the end of the broadcast, he called me up and he said, I pay you to look very happy and comfortable, whatever the chaos behind. That's your job. I never want to see you looking so exasperated and troubled and annoyed again. So how do you remain swan-like as the technology falls apart around you? In the last half hour, it's been announced that Britain has lost a £3 billion American defence contract to the French. Washington made the decision, despite a huge personal effort by Mrs Thatcher, to persuade... It was a one-minute bulletin, but I had just read um, a piece about the IRA, and there was this enormous bang. Flooding is still causing problems in Derbyshire, Leicestershire and the Severn Valley, where thousands of acres are underwater. Sorry about that. One of our bulbs has exploded. And I remember going like that, um, molten glass sort of burnt my... Oh, I felt it on my backside, missed my face. And I came up and went on reading. And a row is expected over the decision to keep classified information on the Burgess and McLean spy scandal a secret. August the 11th last year and Cornwall has been invaded. 
Newsrooms from around the country lie empty as hundreds of TV journalists and technicians head for a beach in Penzance. It's the day of the solar eclipse and an unrivaled opportunity for an orgy of live news. The ITN Channel 5 news team, headed by Kirsty Young, has been planning their marathon two-hour live news programme for over six months. I think there were 50 people working on that OB, so you've got OB trucks, you've got satellite links, we had the Hercules up in the sky, that had there been a lot of negotiation to allow our ITN cameraman on board there. Um, you have all these people who've been working on scripts for about a month, you've got the films that have been made by reporters, so it's horrible. That if you make a bad job, all of these other people have been working ostensibly for nothing at all. It just makes you feel very responsible, and I, I don't like feeling responsible. It's Channel 5 News' biggest outside broadcast ever. Well, we've got cameras all around the area, so we've got uh, seven cameras in this location, three of which are actually in our studio area. When we've got other cameras that are all around, they're being cut together in our OB truck. That's then being fed into a, um, a satellite uplink. So it's being fed from here via a satellite, being received in London, being mixed in with other sources in London, then being fed out to the network. With unpredictable weather and untested technology, the next few hours could be very trying. And there'll be live coverage on the BBC of the Democratic Convention in New York in just in under 10 minutes. That's in about uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> where they've been watching the match on the big screen inside. The atmosphere has been absolutely incredible, really amazing. And I've been out actually since early this morning watching the match build up. Watching the match build up. And I Of course, news has a terrible habit of not standing still. It changes constantly and nothing is quite as challenging for newsreader and team as the late breaking story. We're sure that yeah, we are. This is the template for, for the running order for the programme tonight. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Intro, we're leading on football because of England versus Scotland. If there's a breaking story that suddenly comes in, you know, if that was a really strong London story, we'd pick up on that and it may argue its way into the running order. So I keep the screen split. Menu of the programme, menu of news that's happening, literally, as we build towards going on air. You know, news can happen at any time. It can happen at 5 to 11. It can happen at 5 past 11 when you're on the air. Um, that's the beauty of news. It's, um, it's uh, anything can happen at any time. It's Stingray. <laughs> and I've actually gone on air, and um, it, the, for the only story that seemed to be ready was the weather. As you can see, they're not physical. <laughs> When information comes in during the broadcast, it's crucial for the producer in the production gallery to communicate instantly with the newscaster, and that's the reason for the newscaster's earpiece. When we first started using them, I used to get letters to say, I'm so sorry to see that you're deaf. I think you've got rather an rather obtrusive earpiece. Uh, my earpiece is very <laughs> small. Can I give you the name of the supplier? Most presenters listen to what is called open talkback, meaning they can hear everything that goes on in the production gallery. And that really does mean everything. Kick. Nine, eight, seven, Kick. six. You've got vision mixers, you've got directors, you've got producers, you've got production assistants, engineers, technicians coming out of your ears. Where's the VT? I don't know where the VT is. Why are you asking me? Because we need it now! There is a constant from the PA giving you how long the programme has been running, how long until the end of the next item, and how long on the whole programme. You can hear you know, a load of blathering idiots going on in the, the gallery at the time. Well, we'll have to do this, we'll have to... No, we can't do that, because it's not ready yet. Can you tell him this? Can you do that? And all the rest of it. We can't go here. Can he ad-lib for another 30 seconds? And you are saying something, you know, rather sensitive. And you suddenly hear somebody say, you know, damn, or shit in the background. So you've got this question, haven't you? Yeah. Obviously a huge police operation. You'll just yeah. waffle on about that. It's rather like a racing driver. A racing driver has to assimilate a mass of information coming into his helmet the whole time from the pits. But he's also got to make sure he can get that car around the corner at 120 miles an hour without spinning off. <laughs> of course, the car does sometimes come spinning off. The possibility of disorder exists. On the other hand, it is plainly impossible. <laughs> 
uh, to go on uh, in the old way uh, because goods were disappearing from the shops. They printed much too much money. Professor um, Nova, I believe you've, I believe you've just <laughs> lost your... The, um, I believe... did much too much money. Can, can and, you uh, hear me? I see your earpiece just dropped yes. out there. Can you, can you still hear me? <laughs> I can hear you perfectly. I apologise. No, it's not, not your fault at all. A slight technical hitch. But a slight uh, technical uh, hitch. Thank you for coping with it so consummately, professionally. What about the atmosphere there, Rob? Apart from the noise. I beg your pardon, I didn't catch that, Andrew. It's a bit noisy. <laughs> all that at 12, at 1. Tiddly Ponso, piglets. The Channel 5 Production Gallery in London. It's here that pictures from five key eclipse locations are to arrive via satellite before being transmitted to viewers. With one hour to go before the biggest live news programme of the year, director Andrew Petley has several major technical problems on his hands. And he's about to find out about another. 11, 10, how to guide leading. Andrew, can I just update you on a major difficulty? We do not have monitor here. We still don't have it. Kirsty Young's monitor, which is vital to allow her to see the programme she is anchoring, is not working. OK, yeah. Right, Kirsty, it doesn't sound as though you're going to get off air pictures at the moment. Rehearsing in 15 seconds. 14, 13, It's the last rehearsal and the skies are darkening by the minute. It can't get much worse, but it's about to. Who's Andrew? Sound off A. Sound off A. Cool. Hello and welcome to Cornwall. We are just seconds away from the beginning of the solar eclipse. And let's go back okay, to that live minutes, picture huh? from the RAF Hercules. Thank goodness we've got it. Guaranteed no cloud, not like we haven't got it at the moment. Zion. With only minutes to go till on air, it becomes clear that none of the vital satellite links are working. In other words, there aren't going to be any pictures of the eclipse right, at all. Russell, where's sound from Russell? I'm not getting Russell at right, all. Right, we haven't got any. Kirsty, at the moment we have no picture from the Hercules, we have no picture from Falmouth, and we have no picture from Alderney, so that sweep will not happen. What we're going to do is run through a menu. Let's just see these pictures. You know, do that kind of really kind of cocky TV thing. This is how clever we are. These are all the pictures we've got. And I remember Andrew saying in my ear, and he did it really calmly, good on him. You know, he said, no pictures from Alderney, lost the Hercules. And, what, and I remember just thinking, what can I do? What, and what can you do? You just have to, I mean, at that point, mentally, I just threw my script away. Jason, we really do need a prediction from you here. Who's going to win, South Africa or England? What do you think? <laughs> But uh, I think England might win. I think they'll be more motivated and they rarely lose these matches in Twickenham. Uh, so uh, put your money on England to, to beat South Africa. Good Africa's bowling from Devon Malcolm, maybe? It's rugby, so... Uh, oh, good. It's going to happen, though. Someone's going to have a thing to accept. Well, they're playing cricket. They're playing the cricket cricket's too. starting on Thursday as well. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> the South Africa will win that series. <laughs> OK, Jason, thank you very much. I'll get my sports straight in a moment. <laughs> it's all Thanks. balls anyway, isn't it? <laughs> After the break, the art of autocue. While in Northern Transvaal, we kept at bay, <laughs> Disaster at the eclipse. Right, Charlie, be quiet. Your mic isn't working. Right, I want, I want to hear Kirsty. Thank God I'd waterproof mascara on. Accuracy at all times. Does that now make sense? Part of the roof of the building in the village of Gibbsmere near Southall has been blown off, throwing hundreds of towels, ac tiles across the street. <laughs> and coughing at the wrong time. <coughs> it always happens at the worst time. But now, for a further digest of today's news, let's go now to a break. It's the one piece of equipment newsreaders can't do without. Quite simply, it's responsible for putting words in their mouths. The newsreader's very best friend is the autocue. Words typed here or anywhere in the newsroom come out here. It can go faster or slower. It can even go backwards. Of course, it can go wrong. I'm sure most of us have had that said, you know, you get paid for reading the auto cue. You try and do it. The president is, is homeless, then, excuse me, uh, the president is home after 48 hours. Jim and Harvey Cook told U.S. woman from the Bay of... Oh. <laughs> That's wrong, Marcus. Yeah, I, I'm not doing so well in this, am I? While in Northern Transvaal, we kept at bay... 
Autocue is a wonderful invention in that it enables a newsreader to do perhaps the most important thing in delivering news, and that is have permanent eye contact with the audience. 300 toolmakers whose strike has crippled the plant have agreed to go back to work on Monday. But it's a big mistake to rely on the autocue being there all the time. I rely very, very heavily. I barely follow it on the, uh, on the script. And uh, if the autocue stops, um, I'm in trouble. To be in or not to be in, that is the question this week. Although, um, now there I have a problem because uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the, um, the, uh, the autocue, which is a rare thing that we ever refer to, has broken down. American film star and model. I believe that's the end of the news. Our next bulletin is at six o'clock. I have dreams that are real newsreader dreams, and I only know this because I've spoken to other newsreaders about them. Um, you know, about suddenly you, you check all your scripts before you go on air, and then you come, they come up on the autocue, and they all are either in a foreign language or all the letters are back to front. Now. <laughs> In fact, I think we're going to have a report, are we, from Peter Biles on the, uh, the O.J. Simpson trial. A civil jury in Santa Monica uh, has... Uh, I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> in the old days, autocue looked like this. A simple roll of paper held together with humble sellotape. Crude and unreliable as it was, there were times when it was indispensable. I was doing the six o'clock news one night, it was going swimmingly, and then suddenly th there was three words which somebody had handwritten in, which really spelt disaster for me, and that was spinach on teeth. And it suddenly hit me. Yeah, I'd had uh, spinach salad for lunch. A brief uh, twister or wind gust. Uh, Attention to detail is vital. While the newsreader on the right is reading, the newsreader on the left is listening. Or is she? Feet from where the 40 foot fur crashed through her kitchen, severing her house in the gateway area. Fortunately, no one was injured, although she's not sure where her cat disappeared to. She says the wind only lasted a few seconds. Well, the brief twister or wind gust also sent a tree right down the middle of a Springfield woman's home. Linda Russell was just feet from where the 40-foot fur crashed through her kitchen, severing her house in the gateway area. Fortunately, no one was injured, although she's not sure where her cat disappeared to. We've heard this before, haven't we? I'm sure I've heard this someplace before. <laughs> Back in Cornwall with Channel 5, it's only a few minutes until they are live on air. Pictures are finally beginning to come in from the satellite links, but it doesn't look like there's going to be a single clear view of the eclipse. Do we have Falmouth? Where's Falmouth? No, Falmouth is still... Right, we do no, not have... No, no, it's just, it's just come up. Right, Falmouth, 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 Falmouth has just Falmouth. come up. Falmouth. It's cloudy. Uh, very, very... Old and it's very good. Uh, it's cloudy. It's all right. And the Hercules has gone away at the moment. I may have a scream in your ear, but it has a shot when it's working. It is like being on a kind of roller coaster. You're at the point where you're at the top and you know it's coming, but until you actually start to dive, you don't get the sensation. On air in 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, Months of preparation and the countdown is finally here. Five, and the weather's deteriorating. Three, two, one. The thing that actually makes slightly more impact is the counting into the program, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, on air. Five seconds to the trail, forty-five. The one woman says. Stand by, please, everybody. Stand by. Not into our twenty. Go Tate. From Newsroom South East tonight, Boroughs unite to get London's traffic moving. Then in the last few seconds, when you're going four, three, two, one, I think, do I need to gulp or not? Do I need to do that or not? And then have I, if I do, have I got time? Am I going to actually appear in the middle of the gulp? <laughs> Animal welfare countries are urging Spain to ban bullfighting. Excuse me. Oh, 
Oh, am I on? <laughs> am I on? <laughs> this is a live show, and this man is no longer a newsreader. <laughs> Well, it's one of their funnier little episodes, isn't it? <laughs> Newsreaders have even been known to think they're rehearsing when, in fact, they're live on air. That's at six. We can't wait. Hope you can't join us. Lots of love. See you later. The countdown is over and there's no stopping the inevitable. It's finally beginning to rain. Well, hello and welcome to Cornwall. We're just seconds away from the beginning of the solar eclipse, the most magical and mesmerizing sight that you may ever see in your life. Let's have a look at and what go. we can see from those cameras right now. On your this camera. is the camera right here at Mara Zion, and you're seeing pretty much what I'm seeing, which is plenty cloud this morning. I do remember within the first few minutes of us being on air, I could feel it on my face. We've got cameras at a stone circle high up on Bodmin Moor from where the delicious Russell Grant joins us. Russell, what's happening where you are? How bad is the rain looking? While viewers are watching Russell Grant reporting from Bodmin, the rain is getting heavier by the second. Kirsty and her team try to decide whether to continue the programme in the open air or to retreat to the makeshift studio they've had built but hope they'd never have to use. Stay there for the minute. When you get on Charlie, bring We come out of this and we do the five Well, you know, I just think it's going to look so terrible if we go indoors. That's, that is my opinion. you better stay out, let's do it. Stay with it. It's just a bit, you know, it's only water. I mean, are you, are you worried? No, I'm not worried. I think it will be better to be here and to laugh at it than it is to be a pain in the neck and get in there. Stand by and mix to Marazon Kikaste. Then the decision is made for them. Just as cameras return to Kirsty, water has got into the equipment. Russell, we're coming to you, OK? We lost the link from Kirsty. Q. Well, I'm here now at Bodmin Moor, and I'm at the... Russell Grant has to come back on air much earlier than he expected. 11.30, What's happening? the throw to Charlie. My auto cue's just gone down. OK, auto cue's gone down. Then the heavens open and Kirsty's auto cue goes down. And it's a mad scramble to get everything out of the rain. No problem. Go inside. Go inside now. Camera one, everybody inside. Inside, please. Hi, Kirsten. Can you hear me? OK, do not come to us. We're moving inside. It's gone torrential. Sam, we need to get MCR across that feed. Kirsten, I don't already hear me. We've lost the circle cross. Now, when that eclipse actually happens, not so long... Viewers watching Russell in Bodmin are blissfully unaware of the behind-the-scenes panic in London and Penzance. We've lost the circle cross. I do recall that I got a raging fit of hysterical laughter at some point. I don't know if that was around about that point, because it was, it was high comedy. You know, the, the production meetings, the scripts, the budget meetings, the telephone calls, shipping all the stuff down from London, everybody arriving by train. You know, this massive wave of activity was suddenly thrown into complete chaos by a little bit of rain. And that, that's very, that was very funny to me. Yeah, but we've got to explain why we're not at Mara's Eye on, OK? So when we come back to you, you just have to ad-lib a bit, say, right, the rain's causing all sorts of... With no sign of restoring pictures from Kirsty in Penzance, it's left to Russell Grant to conjure up an explanation for the viewers. Well, we've got a few technical problems at Mara Zion, a beautiful little town, but it's not affording us too much hospitality at the moment, simply because with this eclipse, there's a lot of cosmic energy going on up there. Finally, Kirsty is back on air. Thank you. We are in fact not on the beach, we've come inside because the rain was so heavy that it was drowning us all out and that's why we lost pictures. Sorry about that and thanks to Russell. Poor Russell, who was not expecting to be queued and who was waiting, I don't know, maybe another six or seven minutes before he was, he was due to be uh, queued. And I never thought I would say that Russell Grant was my knight in shining armour, but he certainly was on that day. There's been a gas explosion at a house in Nottinghamshire. Part of the roof of the building in the village of Gibbsmere near Southall has been blown off throwing hundreds of towels ac tiles across the street. <laughs> no one has been injured. Good morning. David Hill's patience is certainly being tested to the full in the closing stages of this year's Formula One Drivers' Championship. The lead he's held all season and the title that's been in his grasp for weeks may yet disappear. <laughs> like that camera. It's the nightmare of the live event. There never seems to be the right amount of news. There's either far too much or, more terrifying, too little. It's another of the newsreader's skills, the art of filling. We are supposedly seconds or minutes at the most away from seeing Nelson Mandela, but we're pretty clear he's coming out very, very soon. When um, uh, Nelson Mandela was released, we were told it would happen at noon. 
And of course, people in Britain thought, oh, well, if they're going to free him at noon, he'll be freed at noon. And all the programming and everything was arranged so that at noon we'd all be live and we'd do an hour's transmission and it'd be very exciting. The decks were cleared, you know, everybody was got down there. All this. Of course, noon struck and um, absolutely nothing happened. But at the moment, we're still waiting here for Mandela to leave through these gates from Victor Fester prison and walk and drive then to freedom and a rally in Cape Town. I seem to remember that we managed to transmit almost an hour without anything happening at all. The great thing was, on the plane down, I had read a wonderful biography of Mandela. I have very, very limited attention span and a memory, perhaps, that she's dead after about three hours. But fortunately, I retrieved almost all of it and sounded like the world's great living expert on on, on Mandela. One thing which may well have been underestimated by all is the extent of the bonds between um, Mandela and his jailers. And there I'm afraid we see that we're all right, but the pictures are coming and going. Uh, the strongest of which is between himself and Blackie Swart, Off who is uh, Mandela's cook and valet. Swart, incidentally, means black anyway, so he's called Blacky Black in a funny sort of way. But there it is. And then finally, of course, just as all the ITV companies were about to go off and get on with some other broadcasting, Mandela appears. And it was of absolute chaos because the satellites haven't been booked to go on any longer after two o'clock. I would go. The I would go, folks. I would go for it. And you join us at the uh, Victor Fester. You join us live at the Victor Fester prison. Nelson Mandela, tall, grey, blue tied, walking towards us in freedom. I think at the end of it all, we still remember this proud and wonderful man emerging from nowhere to everywhere. Newsnight, a live show, <coughs> and Jeremy Paxman has a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Always happens at the worst time. Back on air, Kirsty has made it through nearly an hour of the Marathon Eclipse program. Now the light is fading, the total eclipse is on the way, and with it, more trouble. Okay, shut up, Charlie. We're going to just take this. Fine, we've got ten okay, seconds for go the Hercules. Let's go across the Hercules. We should start seeing Five seconds now. to the beads. Four, three. Right, two, Neil, try and get some more one. gain in the pictures. Five seconds totality. Four. Three, more gain in the cameras. Go to the Goon Hilly. Go to Goon Hilly. It's not synchronous. Go back. Go back. No, we're on the Hercules. That's it. We, oh, that is incredible. As Channel 5 viewers peacefully absorb nature's beauty, the gallery is manic. Slowly, gently. Right, be quiet. Charlie, tell us how it feels for you now. Rays in the background still. It is an extraordinary experience. Right, Charlie, be quiet. Your mic isn't working. Right, I want, I want to hear Kirsty. Kirsty, tell us how it feels for you now. I have to say that that is one of the most extraordinary experiences I have ever had, Andrew. Suddenly, the place went, was plunged into almost total darkness. No, none of that was scripted. No, that was just genuinely my reaction. I mean, we had the, we had the sort of time built in for that, which was, you know, rather cynically, kind of, I don't know what it was, 32 seconds for Kirsty's reaction or whatever, but actually, because you have to do that, you have to build it in in television time. But for me, completely genuine reaction. Five, Channel 5 Eclipse Lights. It's finally over, and amazingly, viewers are blissfully unaware of the ordeal which has been endured behind the scenes. Right, very well done, everybody. Oh. That's about fighting the odds. Hi, MCR, thank you. Switch you away now. Yeah, well done down there. That was a murderous view, I should imagine. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my hair is like a God knows what. A successful transmission and a rare opportunity for a newsreader to break rule number one, never show emotion. Of course, it's a rule which has on occasion been memorably ignored. A bulletin from CBS News, President Kennedy has been shot by a would-be assassin in Dallas, Texas. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. When I announced the um, 
the initial announcement of her death, which happened about, I think it was about 3 a.m. in the morning, I, I really can't be sure. Um, it was just one of the most extraordinary moments of my career because, you know, the hairs go up on the back of your neck, you've checked all your sources. One thing, we don't want to get this wrong. We had been told that the princess was pretty much okay in the initial stages, you know, the reports out of Paris were wrong. Uh, we have a lot of other information coming through uh, uh, and uh, I think you... We do indeed. We have, uh, we have a flash here from the Press Association Newswire uh, saying that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died in a car crash in Paris. The French Interior Minister Jean-Pierre Chevenmont has confirmed that the Princess of Wales is dead. To go from her having, I think it was a broken collarbone, to her being dead, confirmed dead, was an enormous leap. And you just, I just remember looking at it, thinking, what? I, I can't believe it's true. I don't think that's ever happened to me before or since. But there have been a number of um, stories that you're really just introducing and watching as they go out, um, where you feel what actually the audience feels as well, some considerable uh, emotional impact. And then I think it's right to... Um, to have that reflected in a minor sort of way, that you aren't an automaton, that you are a human being with, with, with the normal human feelings. After the break, nightmare tongue twisters from hell. West bank, best wank. Beware the giggle. <laughs> and what really happened on the day the lesbians invaded? Good evening, the headlines at six o'clock. In the House of Lords, a vote is taking place now. This will probably be the one thing that, if I'm remembered for anything, will be it. Well, now, I think there should have been some uh, commercial messages at that point and uh, the reason for the delay and... Um, the reason for the length of... Uh, where's the spectacles gone? What have I done with those? I put them in. I just went out for a bit of a touch-up. For some makeup. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. See you in a minute. It's ten to six, and London Tonight presenter Alistair Stewart is making last-minute preparations for the evening six o'clock programme. Once upon a time, a newscaster was content to be sat behind a sturdy desk with a simple pre-typed script. Today, the newscaster's job has become ever more demanding. Among a host of responsibilities they have to take on, the live interview. Much more difficult is to interview somebody like uh, Mrs Thatcher, uh, who at any moment in the interview, interview is likely to say to you, what a stupid question. And you'll say to yourself, stupid boy, how did I ask such a stupid question? She's absolutely... Then you think, hang on a minute, I'm asking the questions, you're giving the answers. It's a perfectly reasonable question, but of course by then you've already sort of submitted and said, Matron, you're quite right. To suspend Marriott, he would have to... The undisputed master of the difficult interview, Jeremy Paxman, a man determined to get an answer to his question. I was entitled to express my views. I was entitled to be consulted. Did you threaten to overrule I, I was not entitled to instruct Derek Lewis, and I did not instruct him. And did the you truth threaten of, to overrule the, him? The truth of the matter is that Mr Marriott was not suspended. Did you I did not, to overrule him? I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice on what I could or could not did do. Did you threaten to I overrule him, Mr Howard? I scrupulously in accordance with that advice. I did not overrule Derek Lewis. Did you Lewis. threaten to overrule him? Mr Marriott him? was not suspended. Did you threaten to overrule him? I have accounted for my decision to dismiss Derek Lewis Did you threaten in to overrule him? detail before the House of Commons. I note you're not answering the question whether you threatened well, to the, overrule him. The, the important aspect of this, which it's very clear to bear in mind... I'm sorry, I'm going to be frightfully this. rude, but... Yes, you but can... I, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's you, a quite you can straight put, yes or no question, and I will, I will give, yes you, no I will give you an Did answer. Did you threaten to overrule him? You may be able to see it, but can you say it? Reading is one skill, but speaking is quite another. The newsreader should be a master of pronunciation. Every word must be enunciated clearly and, most crucially, correctly. The most vibrant, prosperous cities, what will the new era of Chinese rule bring? And the and I remember Angela Rippert was wonderful. She always used to say, talk about Joshua and Gomo. 
and uh, and I think I mean that was I think oh, that was absolutely great, and she became known for it at the time. I mean, everybody else was saying Joshua and Como, and she went mm, Como. I just have a bee in my bonnet about it. I think it's actually very important that newsreaders, above all, should be people who give correct pronunciation on things. And when it comes to foreign names, again, people say, well, it doesn't matter. Well, of course it does. I mean, if people were to mispronounce my name or your name or anybody else's, um, you'd get very upset about it. This is Jeff Moore, Jeff Mead, TVM News, live Eastern, Eastern Saudi Arabia. <laughs> There's one name which has gone down in news reading history as the most terrifying thing ever to appear on autocue. Yes, there was a gentleman in Africa, wasn't there? Oh yes, what does he call it? Sir Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa. Sir Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa. I was quite unkeen on him, I must say. Sir Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa, something like that, I think. Yeah, it's quite a name to suddenly come across. But the experts say, even if you haven't a clue how to say it, you don't need to give up that all-important poise. The great trick is, whether you're right or wrong, um, go for it. Don't worry about the pronunciation. Whatever you say, say it with authority. Don't hesitate, jump in. I mean, if you hit it with enough brio, I mean, even those people who know how to pronounce it properly think they've got it wrong. Not many cars were moving, but mooing could be heard on the cap early this morning a tractor trailer transporting black and gus there's black or gus was stopped on the side of the beltway while the driver changed the flat tire officials say no people and no cows were injured i wonder if those cows named black and gus were actually black angus cows perhaps black and, and gus, gus. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a possibility that i thought you know, are you thinking explore. i misinterpreted no, something no, no, no. I, I came from the government that was a government source wasn't it what he black <laughs> well, anyway, uh, enough about our cow naming uh, impairments uh, at this point. We're going to find out who's right. right. I suspect it's you. Right. And first, the Even with easy words, the tongue can play teams. terrible tricks. Alster's policemen tell the politicians we won't be used as prawn pawns. I've made my mistake. Instead of talking about uh, Turkish Kurds once, it came out as Kurdish turds. And uh, West Bank, best wank. Oh, good morning, Virginia. A Virginia classic from Bob Corey, fresh roasted penis. <laughs> I was reading the news about 7 o'clock in the evening, but I heard a little sort of plop on the desk in front of me, and I didn't know what that was. It never occurred to me. It was a tooth. And after I finished reading what I was reading, because I was doing it from the autocue, I looked down and saw this tooth. Right there. So after that, I was, I mean, I was so embarrassed, I didn't know what to do, because it was right bang in the front. And so I was reading the news, I saw the stiff upper lip like that. <laughs> and one of my friends said to me, oh, what was the matter with you? Were you drunk? Poise, dignity, authority. These are the qualities needed in a newsreader. But they can all vanish in seconds if the presenter succumbs to the ultimate temptation. The cardinal sin of news reading. Beware the giggle. It's nostalgia for the past. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have another look at the winner. <clears throat> One night I had a story to read. It was an absolutely fatuous story, but it's about some poor fat lady who had been in a garden hanging out her washing, which she carried out in a bathtub, one of those tin bathtubs. And as she was hanging it up, something happened to her, and she fell back into the tub, and she was so fat she couldn't get out of it. Well, now, you know, I defy anybody <laughs> not to laugh at that, and I did laugh. The next day, the editor of the day was severely reprimanded, A, for having that sort of story, and B, for letting the newsreader laugh, and don't ever do it again. So that shows how serious they were about being serious. <laughs> from South End was granted legal aid today to face what was described as the first prosecution of its kind in Britain, being cruel to crabs. The RSPCA claimed that Brian Baker's crabs were overcrowded <laughs> and he, uh, he failed to carry them in a soundly constructed receptacle. <laughs> the hearing was adjourned. <clears throat> A bizarre toothbrushing incident is causing funding problems for a state-run hospital. Officials threatened to cut off funding over an experiment to help patients overcome their fear <laughs> of oral hygiene. 
State investigators say the experiment violated nine patients' civil rights by, for <laughs> pardon me, by forcing them to brush their teeth. The program director, the Eastern Pardon me, this one caught me by surprise. Drinking untreated stream water can give you an intestinal ailment known as beaver fever. It gets its name because beaver, beaver and muskrat are the source of the parasite called Giardia. A state health official says cold weather does not guarantee safe water. David Frost says beaver fever has been found in 31 of Washington's 39 counties, even in the winter. Hmm. As we told you last night on News Center... This newscaster has valiantly kept a straight face so far, but will he crack? Tonight's greeting comes from Master Sergeant Agus Erickson. Tomorrow's <laughs> <laughs> greeting goes out to a family of Dayton. <laughs> a university graduate was found wandering in his underpants after experimenting with magic mushrooms, 22-year-old Philip End of Park Grave in York had eaten a sandwich made from the dry budget. <laughs> and finally. And finally. And finally. But there is one incident which has gone down in the history of television news, when newsreaders themselves made the headlines. And lastly, a story that started in our studios tonight. This will probably be the one thing that, if I'm remembered for anything, will be it. The moment that I sat on a lesbian protester live on the 6 o'clock news. The 6 o'clock news from the BBC with Sue Lawley and Nicholas Witchell. I could hear the director saying, get security, get security. As the titles were running, I picked up the phone beside me, and actually, if you look very carefully, you can see in the titles, me on the phone, which wouldn't normally happen, and I went through to a very bewildered television centre uh, telephone operator and said, it's the 6 o'clock news here, we've been invaded, please send security. Good evening, the headlines at 6 o'clock. In the House Stop of Lords, a vote 28. is taking place now on a challenge to the Stop poll tax. Two of them went and sort of attached themselves to cameras in the studio. There was absolute bedlam in the gallery. One of them came round behind the desk and chained herself to it, just between myself and Sue Lawley, who, magnificently, uh, kept reading the headlines. Tory rebels have said that the tax is unfair and unpopular. Lord Whitehorse told them they should not be confronting the elected chamber. I thought, well, goodness me, what on earth is one supposed to do in a situation such as this? Um, and I got up, unplugged myself, and attempted to, uh, first of all, to drag this um, lady away, discovered she was chained to the desk, so gently restrained her. And I, I seem to remember that I said, shh, please be quiet, you've made your protest now. Another prosecution involving undercover police and alleged... Football. It was perhaps the supreme example of swan-like news reading. And repairing the roads. Why the codes, codes signal a lot more chaos this summer. And I do apologise if you're hearing quite a lot of noise in this studio at the moment. I'm afraid that um, we have rather been invaded by some people who we hope to be removing very shortly. In the meantime, if you can possibly ignore the background news, we'll bring the news as best we can. So once uh, we had been able to um, rid ourselves, or the, 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 these protesters were removed, the news continued, of course. We see their faces more often than we see some members of our own family. Small wonder then that newscasters have found a special place in our hearts. I've had keys sent to me in the post once. Uh, a very kind uh, woman once sent me um, her keys and said, my husband's uh, away, I think, on the North Sea oil rig. Would you like to pop around one day? Um, I politely declined. Bob Dougal, I think because his name sounded Scottish, used to get bottles of whiskey and things of that sort. And Kenneth, who was a very elegant gentleman, used to get things in silver or leather. And I used to get woolly jumpers. I mean, absolutely galore. I can't tell you how many woolly jumpers I got. Um, I, lovely, I've still got some of them. I mean, just occasionally, people had obviously measured up against the screen, you know, so some tiny garment would arrive that you couldn't possibly use. Why do people go bong in the street to me? <laughs> you know, what's all that about? There's no doubt that to be shopping in Sainsbury's and people come up to you and say, well, Mr. Suchet, I didn't think much of that interview, you think, that's right, you know, I mean, let's get these things into proportion. You know, I mean, if you're David Beckham, you're a celebrity and famous because you're good at football, or if you're um, Nigel Kennedy, you're, you're famous because you can play the violin. But a newscaster at the end of the day is really only famous for being able to read out loud. And that's all the news this evening. Good night. And that's the news tonight. Good night. Good night.
Hello. Not since 66 can I remember such a cold 5th of November. I don't know about you, but we didn't hear any of it here at all. I remember one 